Sometimes when studying physics, you get really frustrated when you have what seems like a simple question and no one wants to give you a straight answer. Explain to me why the magnetic force is perpendicular to the magnetic field or I will f***ing kill you. Don't dumb it down or I will kill you. If you say F equals Q V cross B without explaining why, I will f***ing kill you. This is a slight exaggeration of the attitude some of my tutoring students in physics have. Because physics professors tend to think in terms of math rather than physical cause and effect relationships, their answers to questions like these are almost always unsatisfying. To add insult to injury, the non-answers that they give are often accompanied with a hint of contempt, like maybe you're only asking because you weren't really paying attention. Now, to answer this gentleman's question, we will first have to learn something deep about the meaning of fields. This will in turn highlight a path that we might use in the future to go beyond fields and to discover the mysteries that lie beneath them. All of that is coming up here on Inductica. <laughs> So what exactly is this guy screaming about? Let's review. In general, a magnet won't push on a charged object. For some reason, it will only push on that charged object if it's moving with respect to the magnet. Now, to make things stranger, if the magnet puts a force on the charge, then the magnetic force is actually always perpendicular to the magnetic field, just as in this diagram. The way to find the direction of this force is to use the second right-hand rule. To do that, you make this gang sign. It's like shooting someone while flipping them off at the same time. And then what you do is you stick your trigger finger in the direction of the velocity. Then rotate your hand so that your middle finger is in the direction of the magnetic field. So you can see I've done that here. Once you do this, your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic force. So you can see my thumb is pointing in the same direction as the green arrow here. For some reason, this bizarre procedure gives you the direction of the magnetic force. To calculate the quantity and direction of this force, you use the cross product, which you can learn more about in a previous video of mine, which is linked in the description. Now, this guy is angry because it's not at all clear why a field that goes in one direction would cause a force which goes in this completely different direction. Typically, when you ask this question in a physics class, the professor will get a little impatient and he'll just repeat the cross product to you or he'll repeat the right hand rule. He won't get the essence of the question. At this point, a lot of YouTube channels would say, let's provide an intuitive explanation of how this works. I'm not gonna give that to you though. I don't really believe in intuitive explanations. Because what does intuitive mean? Intuitive means in agreement with your intuitions or feelings. But our feelings aren't always right. Our feelings are simply the result of past experiences. And there's no rule that the magnetic force should be anything like our past experiences. After all, something simple in physics like Newton's first law, the law that all objects maintain their motion in an absence of force, is actually counterintuitive to everyone since everyone basically grew up around frictional forces everywhere. So often Often intuitive explanations oversimplify or dumb it down. If I dumb it down, then this student will fudge and kill me. I will kill you. Now, what we really want, and what this poor student is actually hungry for, is a physical understanding. An understanding of the actual cause and effect relationships which make a magnetic field push on a charge in this weird direction. A big reason that this feels so mysterious is that a lot of people think of magnetic fields as these disembodied lines of force that just exist in space. As a result, you're weirded out when the force isn't in the same direction as the field causing it. So the magnetic field is not a disembodied line of force. All it is, is an abstraction that tells us one thing. It tells us the direction that the northern end of a magnet will be pushed at a given location. And of course, it indicates the opposite of the direction that a southern end of a magnet will be pushed at that location. You can see this image where the magnetic field is indicated by the direction all these compasses are pointing. I'm not trying to say that only an abstraction exists here. There is something physical going on here. There's a physical reason the magnets, all these little compasses are getting pushed like that. My point is that we don't actually know the physical reason and the magnetic field doesn't capture it. All it captures is the magnitude and the direction that the magnets get pushed. That's all it does. However, 
we do know one thing about the fundamental nature of magnetic fields, and that is that they are a property of the ether. The ether is a medium which is everywhere, even in a vacuum. One way we can tell that the ether is real is that if we suck all the air out of a chamber, magnets will still attract and repel one another. Now, combine that with the fact that we have experimental evidence that magnetic fields travel at the speed of light. So magnets don't simply act on each other over a distance. There has to be some kind of stuff, stuff that travels at the speed of light, that conveys the magnetic force from one magnet to another. It could be stuff, or it could be some sort of change in an existing stuff. Whatever it is, this stuff has historically been called the ether. Now, physicists in the modern day almost universally reject the ether, and they are all wrong, and demonstrably so. Magnetic fields are properties that are telling us what kind of action will happen to a magnet at each location. Actions are always actions of some entity. There can't be nothing there acting. Nothing isn't a thing that can act. So there must be something, some entity at each location, some ether, which causes the magnetic forces at each of these locations. And incidentally, the ether is also responsible for many other fields and forces as well. This is just one of them. If you wanna learn more about the ether, check out the second link in the description. In that video, I explain the importance of the ether and I refute all of the arguments which are taken to disprove it, including the commonly referenced Michelson-Morley experiment. Once again, all the magnetic field is telling us is that the north end of a magnet will be pushed in a certain direction at a certain location. We don't know exactly what the ether is doing to cause this. But whatever it's doing, when it is in that state, that state of being able to push a magnet in that direction, it's also able to push a moving charge in a different direction, okay? To state that same point again, when the magnetic field points in one direction, the ether is doing something to cause it to push moving charges in a different direction. So now the angry physics student is gonna ask me, well then what, what's the ether doing then? Well. Maxwell, the great integrator of electromagnetism, actually had a model of the ether that explained all of this. Maxwell modeled the ether as a set of tightly packed cells. In this model, magnets cause these cells to spin. When these cells spin, they fatten. They stretch out along this axis for the same reason you feel pulled to the outside of a spinning merry-go-round. So this fattens them along this axis and shortens them along their axis of rotation. Now the northern end of a magnet causes these cells to spin in one direction, while the south end causes them to spin in the opposite direction. Now if a north and south end of a magnet are next to one another, they spin the ether cells in the same direction. And this makes the ether cells spin really fast between the magnets, which causes them to flatten out and take up less space between the magnets. In contrast, above and below the magnets, the ether isn't spinning as fast. These cells are taller than the ether between the two magnets. This causes more pressure above and below the magnets, which pushes them together, so opposite poles attract. Now, let's consider Maxwell's account for why two northern ends will repel each other. The magnet up on top would cause cells to spin in a certain way, whereas the magnet on the bottom will cause cells to spin in the opposite direction. The net result is that the cells between the two magnets don't spin that much. In contrast, the cells above and below each magnet are spinning faster than the cells in between because they're affected by just one pole each. They aren't having their spins canceled. So these cells are flattened out by greater motion on the outside. The net result, is that the cells between the magnets generate more pressure than the cells below the magnets, and that pushes the magnets apart. So northern ends repel. So according to Maxwell's model, when there's a magnetic field in a region, it's because these cells in the ether are spinning. Getting back to the subject of the video, he also had an explanation of why this particular state of the ether also caused charges to get pushed in that wacky direction by magnetic fields. To set that up, let's first think about how this model accounted for how currents generate magnetic fields. If we have a wire carrying current to the right, 
then it's going to rotate the cells adjacent to it along with the direction of current. This means that the cells above the wire are gonna be turning counterclockwise and the cells below the wire are gonna be turning clockwise. Now, let's understand how this model explains why moving charge is pushed in that wacky direction. This is Maxwell's explanation for the student's question. So let's look at that same picture again, but let's suppose this time that there's a northern end of a magnet underneath the wire, okay? So in this picture, imagine that you're looking down on the current carrying wire and imagine that there's a northern end of a magnet underneath that wire, okay? So behind the screen. This would produce a magnetic field coming out of the screen. All of the cells surrounding the wire, top and bottom, are already spinning counterclockwise because of the magnet behind the wire. If there's current in the wire itself, that is also going to change the rotation of the cells, in addition to the rotation that's already there because of the magnet behind the wire. When the current runs, the cells above the wire are gonna have their existing rotation sped up by the current, since their current spins in the same direction. Now in contrast, the cells below are having their original rotation slowed down by the current, since the current pushes it this way. That's gonna make the cells below the wire skinnier and the cells above the wire wider. This creates a downward force on the wire since the cells above apply more pressure than the cells below. And if you use your second right hand rule, sticking your trigger finger along the direction of current and your middle finger out of the screen, then we find that you indeed see that the force is downward, which is in agreement with Maxwell's model. So Maxwell had an explanation for this of why when the ether is in a state that pushes magnets one way, then that state causes it to push moving charges in a different way. Now, unfortunately, this model of the ether is probably not literally true. Maxwell himself was the first to say that he didn't think the ether was literally a bunch of mechanical objects rotating and pressing on one another. My only point in bringing this model up is to show an example of what it would look like to understand the physical cause of these magnetic forces. What it would look like to understand how a certain ether state would push magnets in one direction while moving charges in a different direction. But what is the ether actually doing? Maxwell's model successfully modeled all of the known laws of electricity and magnetism, so it's at least equivalent to whatever the ether is doing on some level, but we have not yet found how far this model can be taken, whether it's consistent with more advanced observations which have been made since Maxwell's time. So, unfortunately, this poor disturbed soul will just have to kill me, I guess. I will kill you because I don't actually have an answer for him. We don't know exactly why the ether behaves this way. All we know is that when it is in a state of pushing magnets in a certain way, that state will cause it to push on a moving charge in a different way. However, I can point you to the way towards how to answer this question in the future. What we're gonna have to do is use our understanding of fields, our understanding of the actions that the ether causes at different locations to make inferences about the underlying nature of the ether. In other words, what the ether is doing to cause those actions which are only represented by fields. We must do what many physicists won't, which is to look beyond the abstraction of fields and find their underlying causes. Understanding more about fields, how they relate to one another, and how those relationships could shed light on the underlying nature of the ether is one of the long-term goals of Inductica. So hit subscribe and join us on that journey. To support the project, go to patreon.com slash Inductica. Members will enjoy access to my 34-hour lecture series, an inductive summary of physics, as well as access to my book, which presents a theory of the scientific method. You can also visit inductica.org slash contact to inquire about one-on-one -on -one physics and math tutoring. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you'll join me as this inductive journey continues.